Alright, this is the introduction to World War One, the Great War. The war to end all wars because it was so big, almost contained every country in the world and there was such a huge, massive loss of life. By the end of this, you're going to understand the main causes of World War I, understand how the main causes brought the war, world to war, know the alliances formed during World War I, define trench warfare, understand how trench warfare is different from previous wars fought. The first initial or main cause of World War I is nationalism. And this devotion to culture or to one's nation. We are the best. We are superior. Think about how you feel about America. All right? We feel that we are better than everybody else. All right? And that's nationalism, a pride in your country. And then there's imperialism. All right? The taking of territory in other parts of the world. So you're going to have Germany start to compete with France and Britain for colonies in Africa, South America, Asia, the Pacific Islands, okay? So imperialism is taking other countries. Well, if Germany wants French colonies in Africa, what do the French got to do to prevent Germany from taking their colonies? Build up their military. Introduction to militarism. This is the development of arms, armed forces, all right? The cost of building and defending an empire leads to more military spending. If the French are protected by 35,000 troops in one colony, the Germans are then going to produce 40,000 troops to outnumber the French. Then the French are going to increase their men over there. And it's just back and forth until we both have a gigantic military. Then you have the alliance system. All right, It's kind of a friendship, an agreement that... If you get attacked, I'm going to jump in on your behalf, okay? Think about it as a street fight. It starts off as one-on-one. -on -one. This guy's friend jumps in. So two of this guy's friend jumps in. And then two more of this guy's friends jump in. And then his whole crew jumps in. And his whole crew jumps in. And you got this big, massive fight in the middle of the street. That's pretty much how World War I starts. All right, we'll cover that. Nationalism, the patriotic, loyalty, and pride shared between people of a similar or his, similar historical or cultural background. All right. uh, Great Britain is going to be led by King George V. They're very powerful, have the best navy in the world, and they're proud of that. Germany is led by Kaiser Wilhelm II. You've got to understand, Germany's only been a country um, within the last 50 years. They finally united as Germans, so they have a lot of nationalist pride of who they are. And they have the biggest and best army all right they have the best soldiers biggest one is biggest amount of soldiers in the world russia also a large army uh pride themselves led by tsar nicholas ii austria hungary gigantic empire led by e emperor franz joseph ii and the french uh, massive army large navy led by president raymond poncare Militarism, this massive buildup of military forces, you can see the sizes, okay? The British have 388 ships, more than anybody else. The Germans, 4.2 million soldiers, all right? Larger than everybody else, but France is close behind, and we'll find out why in just a second. All right, there's a naval competition between Germany and Great Britain. Germany has the risk theory, present a challenge to the British Navy. They're willing to risk their entire Navy just to cripple most of the British Navy. British, best in the world. Germans know they're going to lose. But if they can take out 85% of the German ships and cr cr kind of damage the other ones, they won't be such a force in the seas. The British, on the other hand, come up with their two power standard. They want to build a navy as large as the next two strongest in Europe combined. All right, and if you take a look at the last slide, they have 388 ships. The next two largest are Germany at 281 and France at 207. You combine these two, you get 489. They're only 101 ships away from that. All right? It's this competition of who can be better. And the, you better believe the British feel pretty good about their Navy, and they're willing to take it to anybody else if they want to challenge them. All right? Uh, France and Germany military strategies. The Germans come up with the Schleifen plan. They want to avoid war on two fronts. They have the Russians to the east and the French to the west. What they want to do, and they're right in the middle, they want to defeat the French, turn around, and then defeat the Russians. Okay, The French, they're still pretty 
angry, they want to take back Alizé and Lorraine from Germany. Alizé Lorraine is this little red country here. They lost it in a war previously fought with Germany. Germany won and they took this little land here. The French are very bitter about this, all right? So they want to prove that their military is the best. So they want to test themselves against Germany. That's why they have 3.7 million soldiers compared to Germany's 4.2 million. So that's half a million soldiers more. You can see that, well, I'm clearly never going to beat the Germans military if I don't raise close to 4.2 million men. So once again, building up this military. And then you have imperialism. Remember, that's creating an empire, taking over other countries in the world, either by economic or political dominance. At this time, Great Britain controls one-fourth of the Earth's surface, one-fourth of all of the land in the world they own, all the way from Australia, Canada, Egypt, South America, uh, Jamaica, or South Africa, I'm sorry. Germany possesses colonies in Africa, Asia, and the Pacific. France has colonies in Africa, Indochina, and South America. So you can see Africa all the way through all of them. Asia or China all the way through all of them. Okay, Somewhere in the Caribbean or South America through all of them. They're all competing for this and they all want it. Right? It's eventually going to lead to war because everybody always wants what somebody else has. We'll cover that map and that picture in class. You have two alliances that come out of this. You have Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. They make up the central powers. Okay, so it's Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire, which is nowadays Turkey and other lands over here. And then you have the Triple Entente or the Triple Alliance. I will call them the Allies. Okay, they are your yellow, orangish colored countries. That's United Kingdom, France, and Russia. Those are your three main players. These others will join in along the way. Alright, so you have the allies of United Kingdom or Great Britain or the British, the French, and the Russians. And you have the central powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. Alright, so you can, this is an example of the alliance system. Serbia is going to get attacked by Austria, right? But Serbia is in alliance with Russia. If Serbia gets attacked, Russia will attack that opponent. They attack Austria. Because they attack Austria and Austria is friends with Germany, Germany is going to attack Russia. Well, the French are friends with Russia, and since Russia gets attacked, France is going to jump in. And Germany is going to turn around and attack France, which is going to cause the British to jump in. You can see how the alliance system just pulls one right in after another. That big street fight example. I'll cover this in class. So what starts the war? All right, well, what actually starts the war is Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria. All right, he's like the, uh, the king's uh, little nephew. All right, and he's shot by a Serbian nationalist, Gavriel Princep. He's part of a terrorist group called the Black Hand, all right? They're Serbs, nationalist kind of organization of Serbs, and Serbs also live, are part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and they want to see that united, okay? Austria-Hungary is going to declare war on Serbia. They expect it to be a short war. If you remember the map, Serbia, small country, Austria-Hungary Empire, massive, going to be very quick. Serbia is going to get stomped. However, because of the alliance system, one nation after another is all pulled in. And not all nations are opposed to war. Why? That nationalistic and militaristic feeling of, we're better than you. We can do this. All right, so this is Princip right here. All right, and this is him getting arrested after killing the Archduke. Uh, early battles. Germany has their Schleifen plan. That is to hold off on the Russians, defeat the French, then turn around and defeat the Russians because they're trapped in between both of them. Right? They're going to sweep through Belgium, get into the French, but something happens when they attack France. There's this two parallel system of trenches. They dig in and they shoot across at each other. Right? In between them is called no man's land because bombs blow it up and people are constantly shooting. Nobody will survive out no man's land. Just this barren expanse of mud between opposing trenches. The scale of killing is horrific and huge numbers. 
All right, fighting's inconclusive. All right, um, they're fighting, and you'll have four thousand men killed just to gain twenty yards. All right, not even half a football field of ground. All right, and this is what becomes known as trench warfare, fighting between trenches. One side will get out of the trench, attack the other, but suffer heavy casualties. Then the other will launch an attack, and all the machine guns in this trench will mow everybody down from this side. A lot of loss of life, not a lot of territory gained. All right, so this is just a picture of the Schlieffen plan. Crushed Belgium, go into France, and then all of these trenches get set up along the border area. Alright, so advances in military technology, which we'll cover in the next class, uh, meant that defensive power, all the machine guns in this trench, are out going to outweigh all of the men in this area charging this trench. Okay, so trenches were dug for defensive purposes. You put up a bunch of machine guns along the way and nobody can attack you. What ends up happening is a stalemate in Europe. One side's going to go this way, and then it's going to come back this way, and this way. Not a lot's going to happen gaining territory, all right? And, but a lot of people are going to die. Uh, trenches have barbed wire, concrete machine gun nest, mortar batteries, uh, shooting off bombs from the trenches. Troops are going to live in holes underground, okay? Uh, I'll explain this in class, this situation, but pay attention to the water here. If men have to live in these holes in the ground for months, sometimes years on end, depending on when they're relieved from the front line, think about what happens to your body when you're sitting in a bathtub. Your skin gets all wrinkly, okay? But what do you think these men go to the bathroom? You don't see a toilet on this picture. Where do they go? Well, they probably dig a hole over here and go to the bathroom. Well, the feces and the pee is all going to join into the groundwater here. And guess what you're going to be stepping in? All right. This is a picture of the uh, trenches here. You have the British first trench, okay? Then you have a second trench between here, and then trenches dug all along the way uh, to get back to town, all right? Then you have the barbed wire set up in front. In between there is no man's land. All right, where well, there's going to be a lot of heavy artillery. This is if you want to attack this trench, you got to jump up out of this trench and run across to the German trench. You're, a lot of people are going to die in between here. And then you can see the Germans are going to protect their trenches with barbed wire as well. So here's just some pictures of what trench warfare looks like. I'll cover more of this in class, what they carried on them. These are German soldiers because they have the pointy hats. I'll cover more of that. Trench foot. This is what happens when you stand in water waist high or even ankle high for days and weeks on end. Like I said, your skin gets all wrinkly in the bathtub. Imagine that for days and days. Eventually what happens is you start to get sores. Those sores are going to break open and cause cuts. Guess what's going to get into the cuts? All of the pee and the feces in the water and all of the rats that come to feast on the food and the dead bodies. All right, that's all going to seep into the cracks of your foot, and you're going to get gangrene, which is the stuff that will mutilate your feet. And these are some of the things they'll carry. I'll cover that in class. <clears throat> and America becomes divided on this issue. At this point, we are out of the war. We are not in World War I. This is a European problem. Let Europe deal with it. However, our naturalized or our new citizens from Europe are going to have concerns about it. Uh, the effect of the war on their country of birth. Clearly, uh, German Americans are going to want German Ameri or Germany to win the war. British Americans are going to want the Allies to win. All right? So you're going to have this kind of split in this loyalty of who you want to win. All right? uh, many Americans feel a tie to British ancestry, their language, their democracy, their legal system, because that we were a British colony that was formed all right, a country that was formed out of a British colony. So we feel stronger ties to the British. We also have stronger economic ties with the Allies than we do with the Central Powers. So we're going to side with the Allies, but we're going to stay out of the war for now. All right, this is the conclusion. Thank you.